Thank you everyone for joining the MD Analysis online workshop to learn about the basics of MD Analysis. Um, so for accessibility purposes, I'll just start by giving a visual description of myself. Um, so I have brown hair about shoulder length and I have bangs or fringe depending on what part of the world you're from wearing a white pullover or sweater again depending on where you're from with a purple turtleneck. Um, so I'll give the instructors a chance to introduce themselves in a bit, um, but I'm going to start with just some general housekeeping and first things first, we just want to make sure everyone's aware that we're all going to abide by MD analysis MD analysis's <laughs> code of conduct, um, which is basically be friendly, be welcoming, be considerate, be respectful, be careful in the words that you choose. Um, and this is all because we want to make sure that everyone feels welcome for the workshop today. And so as a reminder, this workshop is being recorded. If you would like to use closed captions, you can hit show captions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, any questions that you have today, please post them into the Q&A section, which you can also find on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll have instructors um, on standby to help answer in text or to answer during dedicated Q&A sections uh, throughout the schedule. Um, if you would like to be unmuted and ask your question live, please just raise your hand and we'll be able to give you the option to unmute yourself. Um, and we may ask you to do that if we need some clarification on a question that was asked. And all materials for today's workshop, you can find on this QR code and on the MD analysis repo and we'll be working off of the October 23 WS branch. So just to quickly remind everyone of the schedule, how this will be running today. So uh, again, we'll just start with some introductions and we'll have Michaela start us off going over some of the basics of MD analysis. We'll then have a short break, um, which will also be used to answer questions specifically about the first lecture. And then Richard will take over talking about positions, distances, and trajectories. And again, we'll have a Q&A for that session, plus a bit of a break for you to get up and walk around, get a drink, um, and then come back at uh, 18 UTC uh, for a final Q&A, which will just be an open session for you to ask any remaining questions that you'd like. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to the instructors to quickly introduce themselves before we get started. Thank you, Jennifer. Um being our moderator and uh, host. Uh, so I'm Michaela. I'm going to be um, doing the first introduction to MD analysis session. I'm a lecturer at King's College London, um, and I am zooming from my office, which is kind of a very boring room without much uh, decor. So you're not missing anything. It's very calm background. Everyone, uh, again, uh, I'm Ian. Uh... And so uh, I'm going to be handling mostly uh, questions as they roll in uh, throughout the um, the lecture here. Um, and I'm currently a postdoc at Arizona State University, uh, working primarily on MD analysis, specifically on the MDA kits, I guess, sub project. So, um, hi, I'm Richard. Um, I'll be taking you through how to do uh, working with distances later on in the workshop. Uh, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I work primarily supporting drug discovery uh, currently as a job. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Fiona. So I'm currently a postdoc at uh, University of California, San Francisco. Uh, and I'll also be um, on deck to, to help uh, answer questions throughout the, the sessions. And then we'll have a uh, yeah, the separate uh, Q and A dedicated at the at the end. But yeah, so look forward to to helping answer questions. All right, I assume you can see and read the uh, intro to MD analysis. So we are, we are going to be starting with a quick overview. So is the font large enough? Can you read it um, decently? 
give me like a thumbs up. Okay, cool, fantastic. So <clears throat> um, we're gonna start with a short overview and we're gonna be a little bit more hands-on later on. Um, so first we just wanna introduce you into the, the world or if I may uh, start with a pun, the universe of MD analysis. It will be all clear very soon. Um, so we're gonna go a little bit over the um, kind of um, what are the main object structures in MD analysis, how to load and visualize the system, how to select different groups of atoms, and then how to apply analysis classes to those atom selections. Um, and in particular, we're gonna focus in the next hour uh, or a bit, um, we're gonna focus on the first three um, of these topics in the next, um, in, the, in the tutorial. Right, so um, the general structure of MD analysis, so everything starts with a universe. The universe uh, represents the ensemble of the atoms and everything that is in your system. So for instance, I assume many of you do biomolecular simulations. Um, so you might have, for instance, a protein, um, maybe you have a protein in solvated in kind of a box of water. So all of that would be your universe. Um, we have um, different uh, ways to group um, atoms. So we, we, we have uh, sort of, first of all, the atom groups. And then we have other uh, different um, grouping, groupings of atoms. Um, for instance, here we have residues and segments, uh, but we also have uh, different uh, kind of, we, we also have different structures that we are not gonna touch on here, but for instance, fragments and, and so on. Um, right. So um, the universe does not only contain the kind of uh, topology, uh, information about the system, which is just kind of the atoms and how they are bonded uh, to each other, so the topology, but also it has uh, the dynamic information, uh, which uh, would be uh, sort of the coordinate, different coordinates um, and uh, iterable uh, frames. So um, we already talked about the different containers. The most important one that we're gonna work with are gonna be uh, atom groups. Um, and in general, everything in MD analysis can be thought of as an atom group. So um, once you, so I assume you have already, or you will be soon starting to run your own uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And so the typical workflow for, um, for using MD analysis is so if you have some, uh, you know, topology data, you have a trajectory that you have run, uh, you import MD analysis into typically a notebook environment, create a universe by importing your data, define an atom group with the subset of the system that you want to analyze. Um, and then you probably are gonna want to extract some position related information. And we will see more of that also in the second part of the workshop. And then you're going to run some analysis. So first of all, how do we uh, load uh, data into a universe? Um, so the basic command is to, uh, so we usually import MD analysis as MDA. Um, and uh, in this case, we can load a universe by uh, specifying first the topology and then the tra trajectory separated by a comma. And uh, something important to mention is that if you, whichever um, program you use for your molecular dynamic simulation, um, MD analysis can probably read the uh, whichever file formats you'll be working with. Uh, so please have a look at the um, the manual and other further oh, sorry further information about which formats are supported. Um, so. We don't only have information about atoms, but we also have information about how these atoms are connected. So for instance, we can, uh, we can extract information about, sorry, bonds. Let me just run this cell first. It's gonna throw a warning, but don't worry about that. So we can retrieve information about the number of bonds in the system. Um, and we can also, uh, we will also play with different properties such as angles and dihedrals and proper dihedrals if they are, if they are, exist. 
And we'll also have a look at the uh, trajectory, um, sort of time dependent uh, information in the, in, the, um, in the universe. So we already mentioned uh, the most important uh, feature of MD analysis are atom groups. Um, and these atom groups have different attributes. So for instance, uh, we have atom names, atom um, residue names, atom masses, charges, and really the amount of information on the system that you can extract uh, will definitely depend on the kind of information you provided. So if, you're, um, if you are reading in a PDB file that has um, sort of um, different uh, fields with information, for instance, in the better field, then you will be able to retrieve that information with MD analysis. If, you're, um, if your universe does not have, uh, for instance, um, information about residues, then you won't be able to retrieve those. So in this case, for instance, we have um, an atom group uh, made of all the atoms in the system, and we have an array uh, that contains all the names of uh, the atoms. So we've been, uh, I, I think I, I mentioned the word atom groups already probably 20 times, and there's gonna be many more to come. Anyway, so how do we actually go about selecting uh, different uh, atom groups? So before we talk about selection, we also want to make sure that we can visualize what we select. And so in, um, we, we will be making use of this really nice extension um, that you can install uh, and hopefully you have in your, as part of your um, environment called NGL view. And this allows to load um, MD analysis objects and see, for instance, in this case, I'm looking at a trajectory of some protein. Um, Right, so everything in, the, in MD analysis is very Pythonic. Um, atom groups can be indexed and can be treated exactly like uh, as if they were uh, NumPy arrays. So for instance, in this example, we have um, an atom group formed by the, the first uh, 20 atoms and we are, uh, we are printing their names. Uh, and so we are slicing uh, this array just as if it was, we were operating in a standard sort of NumPy-like environment. Uh, and so in this case, we can pass this atom group onto, onto NGL view and we can visualize uh, this atom group. So only just the first 20 atoms. So if we were to change this to say 40, um, we would also be changing the visualization here. So uh, there are many ways to select atoms. You don't have to only be very good at slicing um, arrays. There are also uh, a lot of uh, text-based uh, selection. There is a whole um, sort of a dictionary of selection strings that you can look up in the user guide. And here, for instance, if we wanted to just select the protein, um, the, uh, the sort of the whole protein in the system, imagine that we have sort of a solvated protein, we just don't care about the water. Uh, we can select only the atoms that belong to the protein, and again, uh, with NGL view, we can quickly uh, visualize our selection. Right, so a quick overview of uh, how to retrieve atomic positions. Um, so the positions are simply an attribute of the atom. So here we have few the atoms positions and it returns an array, um, an umpire array, which is made of uh, sort of three, um, three different uh, columns where we have X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, and in particular, so at any given point in the analysis return information about one frame. Um, in, in, and in the next session, we will also see how to iterate uh, trajectories and retrieve information uh, that is time dependent. So finally, um, so we, we have seen quickly how to load the universe, how to select some atoms, now the final uh, demo that we're gonna go over quickly is um, how to um, sort of run some built-in analysis method uh, of which I mean, MD analysis has plenty. Um, these methods will not be covered in, in detail in this workshop. This is meant to be a very gentle and basic introduction to MD analysis. And in particular, to, in, it's meant to uh, have you become familiar with the syntax, atom selection and uh, kind of the, the very Pythonic um, fundamental structures. And then you can go on and sort of look at uh, look up your uh, the different analysis that MD analysis has um, implemented. But 
here, for instance, we have um, the, uh, we are calculating the uh, root mean square deviation for the alpha carbons of this uh, test system. And we are plotting the results. Hopefully I can visualize this as well. And we are plotting them using matplotlib. So this is gonna take a second. Um, right, there you go. So here, what we have done, so, or what the, the method has done, um, it's um, fetched all the information about the system, so the, the whole trajectory, and for each frame, uh, it has analyzed each frame. And so now we have uh, the final result, uh, which uh, we have plotted as um, sort of the uh, root, root mean square deviation um, as a function of uh, time in this case. Cool. So as a summary of this first overview, we have looked at um, sort of the uh, main structures of MD analysis, so universe and all that the universe contains, um, how to um, uh, select atoms and uh, retrieve information about a group of atoms uh, from a universe and uh, how to access positions. And so now we're going to get started with the first tutorial uh, and we're going to go over a bit more fundamental hands-on um, atom selection syntax, how to um, retrieve information from the system and accessing uh, sort of bond angle and the hydros. And so we're going to get started. And so I'm going to just have a look at the Q&A if there's anything that I need to address that doesn't look like, looks like everyone else is replying to questions. Great. So fantastic. So I'm going to move over to the first tutorial. So I have a question. I'm reading this question. Can I load simulation trajectories without any topology information using universe? Um, for example, a system made of interacting particles without any bonds and angles. I think you can. Um, you can also create an empty universe and then add um, positions and atoms to that. So I think in principle it's possible, but it's not very common, I would say. Maybe, I don't know, Richard is, looks like he has thoughts about it. This is not something that I've done maybe ever, maybe once. Um, so. Yeah, I think you can load certain formats without any topology information. Um, so this should, yeah, this should work. Um, if you had just like a box of argon or maybe like a metal simulation, I think they might not have bonds. And so it should still work, yeah. So then we're gonna get started on the more hands-on part of the tutorial. So we're gonna move on to the tutorial one system manipulation. So in this notebook, we are going to do pretty much uh, the same, some of the same uh, commands and um, idea that we have seen very quickly in, in the uh, slideshow, but we are gonna actually do a lot of different um, tests with uh, some trajectories. So we're, we're gonna do a little bit more hands-on um, exploration of the different features of uh, DMD analysis universes and how to work with atom groups. So if we start again from uh, how to load, sort of, we, we start, first of all, we import the analysis. That's, you know, first thing first. Um, and then we're gonna work with uh, some MD analysis uh, test data files. So in this case, we have a topology and a trajectory file. Uh, the topology is a PSF format. And then we have this DCD uh, format. Um, and so this universe, has uh, sort of if we print the information about this universe, uh, it's uh, it's a universe that has three thousand three hundred four four and forty one atoms. Sorry. Um, right. So in theory, everything I mentioned this already a billion times. Everything is an atom group in MD analysis. So even a universe. So if we type, for instance, let me just open a new. So um, if we type you the atoms, uh, this is also an atom group that is happens to have 
everything in the system. So every single atom is in one atom group. Um, so um, all the um, atom groups and different attributes that atoms have are very um, sort of array-like. And so here we can go over different uh, kind of uh, data and attributes. So for instance, we have um, indices, which are just kind of the, uh, depending on the way that you input your system, you have, you know, uh, the first atom, the second atom, and so on in the system. Uh, we have the corresponding names. We have residue names. So I guess this is, so I can see the last one is glycine and the first is methionine. I don't know amino acids. I don't work with amino acids, okay? So if I get them wrong, don't, uh, don't at me. Um, so then we have residue IDs, res IDs um, for our friends. Then we have, so we have basically 214 residues. And this res IDs is really interesting because if I look at the shape of this, um, basically for each atom, I have a res ID, which means that, uh, for instance, in the, and just for the res name. So we, we have, if I have a, uh, sort of amino acid that has like five or eight atoms, then, you know, I will have sort of all those atoms, we have the same res name and we have the same res ID. So it will be glycine, 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 and so on. They will be basically the repeated uh, for each atom. Um, charges, different for each atom, hopefully. Um, masses again. And, uh, and finally, uh, some of the most important is the atom types. In this case, the types are uh, numbers, but it could, they could also be, uh, so the, and they are strings in this case. Just note the, the difference between the charges that are in the masses that are um, floats um, and the atom types that are represented as strings. So atom types, as you probably have seen, they could be, uh, in, they could be um, letters, they could be numbers. It really depends on the, uh, the, in the force field you're using. Does the residue name also have lists for nucleotides for DNA and RNA? Residue name, so all this information is not, um, none of this except for the masses, I think, is being guessed by MD analysis. All this information is already in the topology file that you, that um, in this case, that is in the test files of MD analysis. I'm not sure what it is. This is a protein. So I don't think we have DNA or RNA. But I guess if you did have a file that contained DNA or RNA, they would have their own name, uh, which I don't know what it would be uh, as for like residue, but yes, it would basically, it would just have whatever you provide. So short answer is yes, it will work, um, I suppose. And so um, for instance, for atom groups, we have also the attribute of uh, N underscore atoms, which just tells us um, basically the length of that atom group. And so in this case, we can see also uh, if we compare the um, sort of what comes out, if we look at the length of the uh, atom group dot names, it all comes out to be 3,341. So we have, that's the number of atoms in the system. Um, right, so, um, for more information about the different um, information that's been read, uh, I would say please have a look at the user guide and, and in particular also the uh, here there's a link about topology readers and so you can probably um, get uh, some of uh, some of your answers might be also here. Right, so we're going to work with individual atoms, but that's not very common, but we can still say well let's take the first uh, atom in the system and let's look at what it is. So it's a um, nitrogen of type 56 of res name MAT, uh, first residue and seg ID, whatever that means. Um, and so we can also just print all of this information on its own, uh, where for instance, if uh, so the corresponding attrib attribute of the atom would be uh, sort of name, res ID and res name. Um, if we were to, instead of a single atom, we were to select, let's say, an atom group. Um, so if we would say AG is equal to U dot atoms, and we say we want to get, you know, the first uh, 10 atoms, um, 
So the, uh, how would, would we go about identifying the atom names? This is something that we have seen previously, but I think it's important to just remind, um, remind us of the difference when dealing with atom groups or individual atoms. So if you have individual atoms, you have attributes that are sort of, uh, sort of in the singular uh, name, res name, and so on. If you are dealing with an atom groups, you will be atom, you will be calling atom group dot names uh, and not name. So that would obviously return an error. So uh, and the error also kind of useful. So atom group has no attribute name. Do you mean names? Yes, I'm sorry. So just be be mindful of this difference. So if you're dealing with single atoms or atom groups. Um, so we also have, as I mentioned, residue groups and segment groups, um, which, so this tells us that we have 214 residues and we have just one segment. So your whole, we just have one protein that doesn't have many different um, kind of subunits, I guess. Um, cool. I see questions that pop up and I open my mouth to answer and then somebody answers them, so they disappear. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and, so everything is an atom group. So for instance, if we were to uh, select, for instance, if we just wanted to get all the atoms um, that are in the first residue, right? And then we would say, um, so I, I wanted to select those atoms. I could do it in this way. Yes, um, fantastic. So there are many ways to basically um, define an atom groups depending on where you're starting. But for instance, in this case, we can also um, start from uh, the atom group that we had defined earlier, and then uh, say uh, call uh, sort of atom group dot residues, and it tells us uh, this is a residue group with one residue. I never use this uh, because I don't work with bimolecular systems, but um, I think. Statistically speaking, probably 70% of you will find this useful. So I, I'm gonna keep it at that. Right, so uh, first exercise, um, we uh, so load the uh, grow topology file from mdanalysis.test.data files and, uh, and then try and find out how many atoms, how many residues and segments we have. So I'm going to start by hopefully copying uh, in your analysis dot this data files import grow. And then in order to count how many atoms, so I would say Um, so first of all, I need to define my universe using the grow file. And then ideally that returns a universe. So this universe has uh, 47,681 atoms. That's already an answer that we needed. So then if I wanted to look at the, um, how many residues, so I could do it by the universe of residues, right? We have 214 residues. And how many segments? I would also call you dot segments. And it's one segment. So we have one segment, 214 residues, and some 47K atoms. Great. So let's look at the solution. The solution um, is a little bit different, where you can print out in a bit of a nicer way. Uh, and it's making use of this sort of uh, residues underscore and underscore residues and underscore atoms. So which are respectively the number of atoms, number of residues, number of segments, which are attributes that you can call upon. Um, so now a little bit diffi more difficult ever so slightly. So find the name of the first segment 
the last atom and the tenth residue. Differentiate between an atom group and a segment. So let me just go back. So while people are testing, you know, the, the exercise, I'm just gonna go to the lecture slide. Um, Right, so, so we have a universe that contains all the atoms, and then each atom belongs to, uh, or can belong, doesn't have to belong to a residue, and each residue, uh, for instance, like if it's an amino acid, each amino acid will be its own residue, I think. The bio people are looking at me funny, I don't know, maybe maybe that's true, maybe that's not true, I don't know. Um, I decided that's, that's, that's the way it is. Um, and then a, uh, a collection of residues make a segment. I don't know the rules about that, uh, but um, basically a segment group and a residue group are fundamentally the same structures and they behave in fundamentally the same way as an atom group. Um, if, if you just wanted to keep things simple, you could just work with atom groups all the way. And basically, there wouldn't be much of a difference. Um, I think we also have chain uh, attributes, right? Kiona, yeah, some, yeah. Yeah. Some, sometimes we use chain to do segments. It's it's confusing though because yeah. some people have both segments and chains, and it's not very clear how, how that all works. Yeah. It depends format to format. Yeah. It depends on your system. And I guess as long as you find some kind of grouping that works, whether it's a segment or a chain, one of them might work. One of them will give you what you need. Um, right, so, so the solution to 1B, so we are looking at, so the first segment, so we use the Python, sort of Pythonic selection to select the uh, first segment. And when we ask for seg ID, um, and then we use, so to find the last atom, again, we call u dot atoms, we find the last atom, so using minus one, and then we uh, sort of we use the name attribute. And then for the 10th residue, we find the sort of 10th residue again, and we use rest name. So, and this returns, so sort of the first segment is called system. System and system is basically um, um, the whole the whole universe. Uh, there is only one segment, and uh, the last atom is Na, which I assume is aromatic nitrogen or so. No sodium, sodium. Sorry, I I don't work with yeah biomolecules a lot. So for me, automatically I don't I never have sodium. Sorry, Richard is laughing at me. Uh, tenth residue is the lysine. This amino acid I do know. Haha. <laughs> right. Okay. So, and now we're going to move on to uh, some atom selection. So, this is really um, how much time do I have, Jenna? Can you tell me? About 20 minutes left. Okay. That's fun. I, I'm going to make it work. That's great. Um, right. So, selecting atoms, we have already sort of seen how to select. Um, atoms using, you know, NumPy uh, style um, indexing. And so, for instance, we can create an atom group uh, just by, you know, selecting, I want to get the second, the fifth, the sixth, and the first atom in this universe. And this is going to throw a warning, but don't worry about it. So it's, uh, and so I have just created an atom group with five atoms. Uh, or we can use uh, indexing uh, using a range. This atom group has nine atoms. Um, we can also create, uh, we can also use Boolean indexing. So for instance, if we know that we have glycine in our system, we can say, I just want to select everything that is glycine. Uh, and so we can apply a mask, like in this case. Um, and for, for instance, this is going to return um, so the selection array is printing basically the mask that we have applied to all the atoms and it's going to return a bunch of false statements and then we know that the last residue was a glycine, right? 
Um, and so that's going to return true. And all the glycines, uh, we, they have been selected by applying this mask to UDO atoms in the third line. And so we are returning atom group with 141 atoms that are glycine. Even better, uh, MD analysis, we want to simplify your life. So Python is great, but sometimes, you know, there's there's a lot of shortcuts that we can use. So in, in this case, we can use, um, we can uh, sort of, uh, so we can do the selection uh, just by um, sort of uh, indexing it this way or using the residue groups or segment groups, which uh, I, I think is, this is the last time that I'm gonna talk about them. Um, or we can use uh, kind of the, the string selection uh, language that MD analysis has implemented. So um, some of the, so the, the content that we're gonna cover now, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be exhaustive. So at the end of this, you're gonna, you're probably still gonna have questions about how do I select different properties? And the answer is, uh, look at the doc string uh, here, for instance, where um, there is, there are a lot of examples to see, for instance, how to select uh, different residue names or um, different residues uh, and uh, with different constraints and so on, and we're gonna go over some of them. But in general, our uh, advice would be to always refer to the documentation. And if uh, there is something that you um, you think should be possible, but you don't quite know, um, there are two options. One, look at the uh, documentation, and two, look into the, um, the uh, MD analysis mailing list, where somebody probably has asked the same question before at some point. Uh, and there's a lot of, and, most of our questions cover atom group selection. So I would really encourage you to go and check that out. And maybe somebody can put the link to the mailing list in, in the chat. Right, so if we wanted to select all the residues that are called glycine in, in, in an MDR, the most MD analysis way, we would do it like this, uh, where the syntax is simply res name and then the name of uh, the residue. Um, if we wanted to select the first 10 residues, we could do it, you know, we could just index the first residue, the first um, residues, or we could just use this string selection. Uh, so res ID 1 dash 10. So for instance, if we wanted to get all of the glutamate and uh, or um, sort of either Sorry, I'm getting confused with the Boolean stuff. Okay, so we want to get all of the residues that are named glutamate or aspartate. And so we want to use OR. And so we want to have res name GLU or res name ASP. And that will return 474 atoms. Uh, we can also use wildcards uh, depending on uh, sort of the, the name of the atom, the, the kind of the residues that we have in the system. Can you also make an atom group from a residue group defining all glycines? Yes. Let me try, just try and do it. Um, uh, make an atom group from a residue. So u dot res residue. I think I can do it. I don't quite know. I don't even really remember how to make. Oh, okay. So if I just, okay. let me just see. Uh, you could residues. And then I would probably, hmm. So I would need to create a residue group and then defining all glycines. Okay, somebody smarter than me is gonna figure it out in the chat. Um, because, yeah, good job, Richard. Okay, I'm not gonna attempt this. Um, I had an idea, but it, it didn't work. Cool. Um, so we've seen that um, there's sort of wildcards and we can also use parentheses. So if we want to uh, kind of compl uh, complicate, you know, we, we can build um, more and more complex expressions. So here, for instance, we are looking at uh, two different um, residues 
and also we are looking at whatever is returned by the kind of this um, uh, this uh, atom names probably so um, so here name so res name is the residue name and name is uh, referring to the atom name so if we have sort of different nitrogens in this, in the system they are going to be returned as well as this uh, lysine lysine and arginine arginine okay cool um right so there are some pre select keywords for instance uh backbone for amino acids is pretty pretty useful if you use amino acids which i don't uh we have already seen so let me just try this uh, as well we have also seen in the presentation we have also worked with uh protein which also works backbone also works and so backbone what it does is selects all the uh sort of a um atoms name um sort of alpha carbon carbon oxygen and nitrogen which should be in the backbone of all of our um uh, amino acids and so if we check here that these two uh selections are the same uh this uh returns true so this is just a shortcut for for this other expression right so geometric selections are my favorite um, I work with a lot of different um, systems. I usually want to look at um, sort of, uh, for instance, coordination of ions or different uh, aromatic groups, stuff that moves around quite a bit in the, the dynamics. And so usually I'm going to plot some uh, a group which is within some distance from a different group as a function of time and see how that distance changes. Or for instance, if you're looking at protein conformation, you might want to check the distance between two different residues as a function of time. So these kind of selections are pretty useful. And so here, for instance, we want to look for salt bridges um, and we can look around uh, a certain group. And in particular here, the syntax is as follows. So we have um, group acidic and around four, which means for angstroms from group basic. And so this group, these two groups have been predefined. Hopefully, yes, we have defined them, uh, defined them earlier. So, and this will return uh, an atom group with 46 atoms, which is um, essentially the number of salt bridges that you have in, in the system. Um, another really cool selection is uh, by sort of a geometric um, kind of coordinates. So you can have all the atoms that are in, uh, they have a sort of a coordinate, Z coordinate greater than 10 angstroms. And you can do it by pre, uh, sort of prefacing the uh, sort of using the word prop and then uh, Z greater than 10. So this, we could change it by sort of, we could select Y sort of lower than 10, for instance, and this would return some different atoms. I'm just gonna change that back. And so this, this syntax would work with X, Y, or Z coordinates. Right. Um, so I'm just gonna skip the set operations, but I, I'm just going to uh, highlight this um, uh, this particular information, which is an atom group can have a multiple copies of the same atom. Um, but if you if um, if this is not the wanted uh, kind of the desired behavior, you can always use atom group .unique which is a property that will return a version, basically a set of your atom group. So we eliminate any atom, atoms that figure uh, the return more than once. Right, so we have a couple of exercises here about selections. Um, I'm gonna just do the first one. Because I'm afraid we are slowly running uh, short on time. So select residues from uh, 100 to 200. 
uh, using indexing and using a selection string. Confirm that you get the same selection. So for instance here, so to select the residues from 100 to 200, we would just uh, use sort of indexing this way and this will return, sorry, this will return a residue group with 101 residues. Um, in alternative, we could use a selection string. So we could say u.select atoms, res ID 100 to 200. And then we could call this AG2. And then we can turn it into a residue group by calling um, residues. And so we obtain the same uh, we obtain the same thing, and we can check also the solution that these two selections are the same. So in one case, we just directly selected the residues, and in the second case, we selected the uh, first selected atoms that belong to the uh, the residues between 100 and 200. And then we went back from atom group to residue group by uh, using the residues attribute. Right, so there's a few more exercises that you can go over. We have the solutions already, uh, but feel free to kind of modify them and uh, test, um, test your understanding and go over the content again. So, we're just going to quickly go back to the visualization with NGL view. Uh, again, for um, so this are, is a very quick uh, demonstration about how you can load and analysis object into NGL view. But we would also encourage you to check the NGL view example uh, gallery and um, the um, the doc uh, the documentation for the package, uh, just to have a sense of how much you can uh, customize your your viewer. Um, so the really cool thing about NGR view is that you can kind of, uh, oh, it doesn't make me zoom into the, okay, this, yeah, my mouse is not allowing me to zoom in, but I can visualize the trajectory and we'll talk about trajectories in the second part of this workshop. Um, we can click on atoms and you see that uh, if I hover the mouse over uh, some different atoms, uh, some properties come out. So this glycine, hundredth residue, uh, carbon alpha comes out. Um, and we can also change the visualization. Um, so for instance, if we wanted to look at this particular helix, uh, to make sure that we are indeed selecting the correct range. So if we were to change this interval from 25 to 26, oh, this is kind of, we are selecting a residue that does not belong to the helix. So we kind of, we can check visually um, what we're doing. This looks like a bit of like a fusilli. I love that. Um, but biology people, they have the most fun with this uh, structure. We can also add different selections to the same view as we've done here. So for some reason we have added one of these residues, we wanna visualize it with the licorice um, representation, just to see that it's indeed uh, the 20th residue looks like, I don't know what amino acid this is, but it looks like everything is good, I guess. Um, so we have a couple of, um, we have a couple of exercises where you can, for instance, uh, select all the atoms that are below a certain plane, and then you can go, um, you can go, for instance, um, and check using uh, NGL view to see wh whether sort of how your selection um, is different uh, or how your selection shows up in uh, in NGL view. So if we were to do that here. So this would be all sort of the portion of our protein that has 
sort of this above uh, in the positive part of the x axis. Sorry, the negative part of the x axis because it's uh, oh no, this is actually so x is more than four. So that would be um, yeah coordinates lower than four. So if we change this to be greater than four, it would be the other half. Interesting. Okay, so this is just a really fun way or very useful way if you're doing an analysis you are building some analysis for your system it's a really nice way to kind of um as you build your analysis tools and you check uh you kind of doing some data exploration on your system it's a nice way to um make sure that what you're selecting and the properties you're calculating uh they indeed are on the atoms that you intend them to to be right um I'm gonna just finish with uh, something about bonds because I know that Richard's um, section later is gonna be all about coordinates and bonds and other stuff. So I'm just gonna um, so have a look at this uh, new uh, universe. And uh, so I tried to retrieve, so I loaded a new universe um, and then I tried to call the bonds attribute. And I get an error here because it says, uh, basically, we do not have bond information. Um, and this happens if your PDB, for instance, does not have connectivity um, information, um, yeah. um, connectivity information. And so um, what is the solution in this case? How can we make sure that we have, uh, the, and the analysis uh, can infer uh, which atoms are bonded and which atoms are not? So in this case, we can use the uh, different guessers that MD analysis has implemented. Um, in the case of, uh, so when you load a universe and you already know that the universe does not have bond information, uh, I would always recommend that you add the um, sort of the, um, the optional um, variable guess bonds equal true. And so in that case, if we try again and reload the same universe, we get rid of the error. And now we can look at, uh, our fantastic universe that has 3,365 bonds. Um, and from the guessing the bonds, we also have angles and the hydros because all of these properties um, uh, are only available if we know which atoms are connected to which, and they are all kind of inferred at the same time. It's kind of a cascade. So bonds then populates angles and then we populate the hydros. Um, this can be also, in, so you can inquire about individual bonds, like you would inquire about atoms, um, but um, this is kind of, uh, this is interesting if you have a system for which you want to look at a specific, you know, uh, bond between certain atoms and you can return arrays that contain the value of each bond. Um, and you can do that for sort of the whole system or even just for an atom group. Um, or even just for a single bond, just in this case. Um, so here, just to kind of uh, conclude, we are uh, sort of, we, we're gonna just plot, this is really to kind of humor me with this. Um, we're just gonna look at the histogram of the distribution of bonds in the system. Um, and yeah, so this is good because it means that there's nothing below Sort of unphysical value, so we probably have a bunch of like carbon hydrogen uh, bonds, um, and then we have some you know carbon carbon bonds, probably around 1.4 um, single bonds. Then we might have some double bonds here, and then probably some you know carbon something else bonds that are probably in this area here. Um, a lot of carbon hydrogen bonds of different lengths, or probably nitrogen nitrogen uh, and oxygen hydrogen bonds as well. Uh, and so just having the possibility to plot all, all the different values, again, and very important when troubleshooting um, data. Right. Um, so I'm going to leave the dihedral section um, to kind of for you to go over if you are interested. Uh, and again, I'm just going to remind you that we have links to the uh, documentation throughout both for the different selection for the topologies that we read and also for NGLView. So feel free to kind of peruse and go and um, have a look at those. And if you have any questions, we'll be here. 
until um, 6.30 UTC. So if you come up, if you try and do some of these exercises and you don't, uh, and you want to have a little bit more feedback from us, um, just pop a question in the Q&A, we'll, we'll pick that back up um, later. Thank you. If you have any questions, please just drop it in the Q&A or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, otherwise, go ahead and take a quick break and we'll reconvene at 1645 UTC where Richard will tell us about positions, distances, and trajectories. So we have a question. Is there a way to slice the frame of the trajectories? or combine two different trajectories to a single trajectory file? Um, yes, but there is a but, which is that you would be, so you can slice the trajectory, but you, if you want to combine two trajectories, you probably would be playing with two universes in, I think, Fiona, what do you think? I think you would be probably loading two universes with the same topology, like topology trajectory one, topology trajectory two, and then you you would merge them, right? Uh, yeah, because I know we do have um, we do have ways of merging universes, but yeah, yeah, like you, you know, it it gets very difficult if you've got different atoms in them, kind of obviously. Um, but yeah, oh, but yeah, insofar absolutely. as if it's yeah. like you know, if you've done two repeats of, of the same system, then yeah, there are ways to, to put those together. Yeah. Yes, so if it's the same system, you just have two different uh, repeats of the trajectory and you can use the same topology, yes, you would basically be loading um, U1 equal topology, uh, comma trajectory one and then u2 equal uh, topology mda dot universe and then topology comma trajectory two and then there's a way basically of merging universes and then you would have a single universe which would have both series of frame both series of positions you, you can also, so when you create your universe, you can also give a list of trajectory files um, uh, so that, yeah, so that again, as long as they've got the, the same topology, that it will read them all in and create the universe all in, in one go at the start there. Oh, that's right. You're right. And so, yeah, you can basically load a universe with one topology file and then you just trajectory one comma trajectory two comma if you have more you can add more and i guess they would be loaded so if you have a 100 frame each depending on the order in which you add the different trajectories they would be just loaded sequentially right yeah so in this case if you have a simulation that stops and then you restart you end up with two let's say two DCD files, and you can load them one after the other. And then you basically just make your, your uh, you have your overall trajectory with all the frames, yeah. Yeah, typically the way I do it is I just use the glob functionality in Python, just select all trajectory files and load them in as a list. Oh, it's nifty. So do you pass, when you build a universe, do you pass a topology and then a list of um, trajectory files? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a list, but I might expand it. I don't quite remember. Okay, um, but yeah, basically that's how you, okay, cool. Yeah. You learn something new from, from everyone. And th this is the thing that MDN is super versatile and every one of us, like they, they will know very well our little corner of the stuff that we use very often. And then you just talk to people and you learn a bunch of uh, different uses. Sometimes we forget that something is possible. So we have a question about um, all the different properties that can be calculated with MD analysis. And I think maybe 
a good way to answer that of Fiona and of Fiona is typing, but maybe each of us could also say what they use and the analysis for in their normal sort of day to day. So I, I'm just gonna go ahead and start and say I use a lot of atom selections to calculate kind of time dependent properties of atoms. Um, so for instance, coordination sphere analysis, coordination shell analysis. I use the RDF quite a lot. Um, I I mostly nowadays I mostly use the analysis to build custom analysis, um, which are obviously dependent very different depending on the project because I work on kind of soft matter polymers and so I don't really work with proteins or anything that is well defined. So every every project will be a different property that I'm interested in. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in. Yeah, so uh, typically I use it for things like uh, getting contact distances, so for instance, salt bridges, and then using that data to classify structures based on um, con uh, based on those contacts. So you can make pretty sophisticated analyses pretty quickly. Yeah, I've also done, you know, yeah, a lot of like distance analysis for finding finding contacts and um, uh, you know, things like identifying ion interaction sites on a protein. Um, there's also um, uh, say like some more specific things, for example. So I've I've done stuff with um, membrane proteins where we have um, conformational changes that involve helices moving. So uh, uh, there's a, like a tool called um, Healer now that can get you um, sort of the the angle of of a helix and things like that. So yeah, hi. Um, so we're now going to look at maybe the more interesting half of the uh, of of the materials, but we're going to be looking at atom position. So a lot of what we were doing in the first half was was in some ways you can boil it down to selecting a subset of your overall atoms. That's sort of a lot of what you do with the first half of the materials. And then once you have selected the first half of your atoms, you then want to look at their coordinates. And so we're looking at the <clears throat> the back half of this problem. Um, so I'm assuming that my notebook is big enough and clear enough for everybody. If you are not finding it big enough and clear enough, I can probably make it larger. Um, <clears throat> so so the, the, the coordinates are, are accessible via the dot positions attributes of an atom group. Um, so these give you a NumPy array, um, which you can then use as you can use a NumPy array. So we're going to do a quick example here where we look at a, um, we have a grow file here. In a TRR file. Um, we're going to select the protein atoms. Uh, this is done based on residue names. And then we're going to pull off the positions of the protein with this atom group dot positions call here. And so if we run this cell, we, we've got a little print statement here, but we see that the atom group has 3,341 3, atoms and we get an array with shape 3341 by 3. So this is a three dimensional array. We obviously have a row for every single atom and then we have a column for all of the x coordinates a column for all the y and a column for all the z so you'll get these numpy arrays out here it's just called pause um you can do um, if you wanted to slice you know just your x coordinates out, you do it like that. it's just a numpy array um and you can use it in anything that numpy arrays can be put into um there's some really basic examples of built-in functions we have sort of center and mass incentive geometry also on an atom group that are working uh, on positions. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the a lot of the work you can do with MD analysis could just be on those numpy arrays and you, that could be the only MD analysis you use and then you get your numpy arrays out and then you run off and put it into SciPy and you put it into numpy and you could sort of leave it there. One place that you might uh, realize that you need a bit more help is when you start looking at distances. Um, so while there are sort of distance calculations in NumPy and SciPy, um, in, a, in molecular dynamics, we have this periodic boundary condition uh, phenomenon or sort of 
uh, effect where it's sort of this Pac-Man geometry, right? Where, where when you leave the screen on one side, you sort of pop in on the other, right? And so this is how we keep our simulations um, always touching solvent, for example. And so when you think about distances between um, between atoms, you need to think about periodic boundary conditions. And so that's why you probably should be using the lib.distances uh, module of MB analysis, because it will take care of this periodic boundary conditions for you. So you can import this with um, this line, uh, and you should get this module distances. Um, this is reasonably well optimized as well. So another reason to use this is it's probably faster than what you can write yourself, but it's also not the fastest in the world. So if you're good at programming, you can probably write something faster, but it's, it's probably faster than what you can write is another good reason to use it. So there are various functions within this module. I'm going to sort of go through them now all in turn. Um, it'll be a bit quick, and then we're later going to go back and looking at how to use these on more applied examples. But for now, I'm just going to show you the basic um, shape of the inputs and the shape of the outputs for what you get out. But then we're going to go back and revisit them if this is all a bit quick. Um, so the first interesting function is distance array. Um, so here, if I, if I arbitrarily grab two atom groups so here I'm just using the slicing to slice 10 atoms for the first atom group and 20 atoms in the second atom group I then put it into this function called distance array um, so I put in the atom group one dot positions and the atom group two dot positions so I'm putting in these two arrays of coordinates into the distance array function um, and so here we have a little handy print statement that's going to tell me what I have so I sort of put in a 10 size and 20 size atom group and it's given me out a numpy array that has size 10 by 20 so based for each atom in the first array it's calculated the distance to every other atom in the second array and then the same for each array so if you think about the number of possible combinations there are you should get a 10 by 20 matrix of different distances um, so this can get quite large quite fast, as you can imagine. So here, DA is going to be a NumPy array of shape 10 by 20. So you've taken your coordinates, you've calculated distances. Um, I'll talk more about periodic boundary conditions in a bit, but you can just see that I've put in box equals u dot dimensions here to sort of tell the function about periodic boundaries and, and the shape and size of our primary unit cell for our simulation. OK. Um, I'd encourage you to, to raise a question if I go anything ever anything too fast as well. Um, so yeah, so if, to look at kind of to drill down into what this matrix represents, if I wanted to know the distance between the fourth and the sixth atom, maybe I'll just to double check that. Remembering that we have zero based indexing here, so the fourth atom is you index that with square brackets three. You can pull that out by just indexing this two-dimensional NumPy array here. So if I run this cell, the distance between this particular atom and this particular atom is at this DA35 sort of address within the matrix. Um, okay. Okay, so that's distance array. That's probably the function you will use the most. So if you remember one <laughs> distance function, it probably should be that one. Um, Self-distance array is very similar to distance array, but if you only have a single array of positions and you want to calculate all combinations within that array to itself, this was what you'd use for self-distance array. So if you had um, just a simple box of argon and you wanted to calculate all the difference between the different gas particles and you only have, say, one species, you'd use self-distance array. So this takes a single array of coordinates in here. Um, and it will yield, if you think about it, it will yield half n times n minus one distances. So this is sort of a triangular, all combinations in a triangle. If you draw it out, it makes a lot of sense why it's this shape. But um, you'll get a single flattened array of that, of all the distances. Um, it doesn't include, obviously, distances against itself. So there should be no zero values in this array. So that's what that will look like, for example. Um, so this is also quite handy. Okay, so the next interesting function, calc bonds. So this will, again, calculate distances, but instead of calculating all combinations of distances, it will calculate pairwise distances between two arrays of... I'm going to stop. I've got a little question. Do you want to type a question in the Q&A before I move on from self-distance array? 
Um, or Jenna, do you want to work the magic with the microphone? Um, I'm not seeing a raised hand. Is there someone with oh, okay, their hand? Okay, maybe I saw a ghost. That's fine. Um, okay. I'm sure that'll ask a question in the Q&A. Um, so Cal Bonds, um, oops. So if you have two arrays of two coordinate arrays of equal length, it will walk through the arrays one by one and calculate the distance between each pair of coordinates in the arrays of matched length. Um, we often use these for calculating distances between bonds, for example. So here we're going to again arbitrarily select ten atoms and another different ten atoms from the from the universe, and we're going to drop them into calc bonds here. Um, here we're giving boxes none that will not use periodic boundary conditions. Um, and again, we have a quick print statement that'll uh, tell you what's going on. So basically, I, each array was was ten uh, coordinates long, and then the output I got out was ten coordinates long, um, and that's because it's it's zipped over both arrays. And so the distance between the first coordinate is this dist zero entry. Um, so the difference to distance array, just to drive home the point, is distance array did all combinations between the two input arrays. So you would have got a multiplication of the two different um, sizes. So this would have given you a 10 by 10 output if it was distance array. And calculate bonds will give you a single column of 10 distances. Cool. Uh, so related to these, this is the calc bonds. Um, oh, sorry. And just to clarify there. Um, the atoms don't actually have to be bonded for this to work. They're just, it's just doing pairwise distances. Maybe calc bonds is a bad name. Um, I might change the name one day to calculate pairwise distances. So yeah, um, calc angles and calc dihedrals, um, the names might suggest they're gonna calculate a either an angle based upon three coordinates or a dihedral angle, which is calculated between four different coordinates. And then it will do a, it'll, it'll accept arrays of, of arrays of inputs so it'll calculate you many angles or many dihedral angles um, and so for angles this the middle input array is going to be the apex of the angle and then the two other arrays are either side of the angle um, and so here we're going to arbitrarily select three atom groups of 10 um, put in the coordinates and we'll get out some angles uh, it's worth remembering it's always worth thinking about when you think about angles is is this going to give me um radians or degrees and we output uh radians um so you'll have to convert those to degrees um you should always double check this when you look at angles that's a mistake i've made far too many times to admit to um and then similarly if you want to calculate dihedral angles you'll need an extra set of coordinates this is a bit more complicated but it might be one of those ones if you draw it out Will make a lot more sense but the, the way a dihedral angle is defined is you have the first three arrays of points will give you a plane you can define a plane of, of three points and then the second third and fourth array of coordinates will define a, a second plane and then you're looking at the angle between those two planes um, i think we have it so that a trans configuration is 180 degrees um, but again, that's something you should check because some people think a trans configuration is zero degrees. And you should double check that whenever you work with dihedrals because it's probably about 50-50 about how people consider that. And that's a common mistake people make. So that's dihedrals. Okay, so next up we have the everyone's favorite topic of minimum image convention, which is another source of a lot of mistakes in, in computational chemistry. Um, so if you have given a trajectory file that has box information, um, it's accessible via this u.dimensions attribute here. So if I run this cell, so this is telling me that my box is, is 80 angstroms by 80 angstroms by 80 angstroms. And these second three values, these are the angles between the, um, between the axes of the primary unit cell. And so this is often called the uh, ABC alpha, beta, gamma convention. And so this is what we're looking at here. So these two angles here being 60 mean we're looking at a triclinic cell. So it's like a, a rectangular box that someone sat on, so it's got a bit squashed. So that's what we're looking at here. 
Um, the mathematics about doing minimal image convention on a triclinic box is a headache. And so that's, again, why you should use someone that's done it for you. Um, so as an example of how this can make a difference, if I select my protein atoms, I can calculate the distances between all protein, protein atoms, and I can look at the maximum distance here. So this is giving this first half of the statement will give me a NumPy array, and I'm quickly just calling max on it. And I'm doing the same function called twice, once without giving it a box, and once with giving it a box. Um, and we can see that. Uh, without the box, you get given a distance of 90 angstroms. And when we provide the uh, description of the unit cell to apply minimum image convention, you get given a smaller distance. And that's because it can see uh, a smaller distance between the two atoms in a different um, image, if you think about it. Um, so that's a fairly common mistake that you could make if you didn't think about it uh, enough. Um, the other thing that's worth thinking about, two things worth thinking about, is you don't always want to use minimum image convention as a rule. Um, there are certain times when you actually do want to use the longer distance. Um, so you sort of have to think about whether you want to use this. I think using it uh, all the time just without thinking is probably also not the correct answer. Um, so you should sort of think about, do you want the minimum image or are you measuring something which could span uh, greater than greater than half the box, for example. So for the example of looking at the, the size of a protein, maybe the protein is roughly the size of your simulation box. And so maybe using minimum image convention here is actually incorrect. <clears throat> um, the other thing worth thinking about is if you're looking at um, measuring an angle, although it's not a distance anymore, you still have to think about minimum image convention because um, when you when you're calculating an angle, you, you define two vectors or, or many vectors between atoms, and the vectors that you draw between the atomic coordinates have to follow a minimum image convention, otherwise the vectors you're drawing will be incorrect, and then the angles you're measuring on those vectors will also be incorrect. So you also should think about putting in um, uh, unit cell or box information to the angle calculation functions, because that's quite important for correctly defining angles. Okay, just going to quickly check chat. No, good, we're good. So finally, we have two extra functions here um, called capped distance and self-capped distance. Um, and so these are useful for when you're looking at distances, um, but you're only interested in distances up to a certain limit. This is quite common. For example, if you're looking at a radial distribution function, if you're sort of implementing a radial distribution function or something similar, you might only be interested in, in distances which are up to a nanometer or 10 angstroms or something like that. And calculating distances which are larger than that is just not interesting to you. Uh, and so you can save a lot of computational time um, by, by defining an upper limit on the, on the size of the distance you'd like to calculate. Um, I think here, sorry, my example is I'm looking at hydrogen bond analysis. So obviously, if you're looking at hydrogen bonds, you're probably looking at quite a tight distance, maybe up to four angstroms here I've done, but you know you can use whatever definition of hydrogen bond you want. Um, so if you're looking at very large systems, where large might be roughly 50,000 atoms or more, depends how fast your computer is, um, you should look at maybe these capped versions of distance algorithms because they will do, um, they'll chop up the box into little pieces and they'll look at only distances between neighboring pieces is technically how it works. So uh, a quick example here. So I'm quickly selecting all hydrogens in my solvent. So here I've got res name sol is the name of my solvent. Your solvent name may differ. Um, and type H is going to pull out all the hydrogens. So this will be all the hydrogens in my solvent. Um, and here my acceptor, I'm looking at all protein atoms which have type N or O. So I'm looking at nitrogens and oxygens in my protein completely arbitrarily. Um, and I'm, I'm going to sort of put the positions of these into this cap distance function. I'm going to put in a minimum cutoff uh, and a maximum cutoff to sort of define the distances that I'm interested in finding. Uh, the minimum cutoff here is optional. Um, and again, you can give it this box equals u dot dimensions uh, argument here. So you, again, pay attention to minimum image convention. Um, and so I just run this cell. Um, so from 22 
1,168 hydrogens and 600 acceptors, we found this many different contacts where this is the length of this uh, index array. So, sorry, it returns these two arrays. One is the indices of the atoms that it found uh, short contacts between. And the second array it returns is the distances of these arrays. Um, so we found this many different contacts by looking at the length of this IX array. Uh, and then just to look at the first three hits that we got, this is going to be printed down here. This is telling me that between the second atom and the 134th atom in the hydrogen and acceptor arrays had a distance of 3.89 angstroms. That's sort of how to, to, read, to read this. Um, so I did promise you that this should be that this should be faster than running at brute force. And so I'm just going to quickly show this. So we had 22,000 atoms here and 600 atoms here, which isn't huge, but it's also not tiny. And so in, in a Jupyter notebook, you can use this uh, percent sign time it magic function, which will benchmark a, a function call. So here I'm going to calculate using distance array, which was the brute force way of calculating all combinations of positions. So if I just quickly run this, this takes me 300 milliseconds, which is a third of a second. It's not so bad. Um, but obviously, if you think about, if you want to get boring and think about computational scaling, this is going to scale horribly. So as you increase the problem size, it gets slower and slower and slower. Um, whereas if we do this cap distance version, this is taking 26 milliseconds. It's about 10 times faster. Um, uh, if you want to, again, get boring and technical, this won't scale so badly. So you can put in very large systems and it will, uh, it won't get, fast. it won't get slow so fast. <laughs> it won't, it won't, the performance won't degrade so fast. Um, okay. So that's a description of all the different distance calculation functions with an MD analysis. Um, you can think of them as building blocks or running your own analysis. Um, a lot of the times you will be using these without realizing you're using these. For example, if you're looking at an RMST calculation, you're probably using these without realizing. Or if you're looking at um, diffusion or various things, they'll be using these building blocks under the hood. And so it's quite important to understand how they work so that you can A, build these advanced tools yourself, maybe but also have an appreciation for how your different um, quantities are being measured. Um, so these are the names of the functions that you should sort of be vaguely familiar with. You should think about periodic boundaries and minimum image convention when you're doing computational chemistry, otherwise you will run into problems. Um, and I think that's the end of the first half of the second half of the of the of the workshop today so i'm going to progress on to the second notebook which is a bit more applied um, so if you're following along at home you'll have to switch to this um, tutorial two notebook um, you'll need to skip these colab notebook calls at the top if you're not playing along in colab i'm not i'm running this on my computer but if you're running in colab you should run those cells um, and we're going to look a lot more about um, distances in, a, in an applied fashion here. So we're going to quickly download. Oh, no, we're not. I forgot to install NGL view. We're going to skip the visualization section here, unfortunately. Um, so we're going to download this um, PG example. Um, we're going to load an example. This is a coarse grained. Um, Peg example. Uh, yep. um, so, sorry, this peg is a coarse grained universe um, where each residue is actually a chain of the polymer, which is confusing if you do proteins. So each each residue is a single strand of the polymer. It's a single wiggly thing. If I had remembered to download NGL view, you could have viewed it with NGL view here, and you would have seen uh, a bunch of spaghetti in a box. Um, so that's what you're missing out on here. I'm sorry about that. Um, so first, we want to look at maybe some positions. So this is an example of pulling out the positions of the type OS atoms here. Um, if you if you don't know which type atoms you have, uh, a thing I often do is you can do 
just look at a set of the different atom and we'll see that we had sort of these atoms that I could have selected. So we have HWOW, C3, H1, HO, OH, and OS. And these will be from your topology file. Um, here we're seeing that if we used um, numpy.mean of, of the positions, we will calculate. This is a way of calculating the center of geometry. Um, but again, we can use this built in. MD analysis way of doing the center of geometry. And you can see that these two function calls are roughly equivalent. Um, but then if you want us to do something fun like the radius of duration, which is quite common for uh, polymer chains, you can calculate the radius of duration like that. Uh, again, we can, and another interesting uh, quantity for polymers is the end-to-end -end distance between the between the polymer chains. Um, we know, because it's sort of a, a system we've simulated, that we have these type HO groups as, as capping groups on our polymer, so we can select them. Um, something kind of fun is happening here where we have, um, if we just whoop, select the, ooh, I need to pass, this will give us an atom group with two atoms. Um, so. If we unpack this as sort of A, B equals that, this is a Python trick where if you unpack an object onto two variables, it will give you the two items in a container by selecting that. So here kind of A is, is one of those items in a container and B is a second. So this is just a little Python trick that's happened here to define these H, B, H, begin, and H, E, H, end uh, things. Again, you could use NumPy's norm. Uh, function to, to calculate the distance between these two. Uh, otherwise, we could use this calc bonds function that I defined before, where an example, where an advantage of this is you can give it a box information to calculate the minimum uh, minimum distance between. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to switch to a to a different system here, which is now a, a protein system. Um, with this fetch ADK transitions here. So this is a kinase system here, which is doing some fancy biological stuff that Ian will be happy to tell you all about later because this is from his lab, but I won't spoil his glory here. Um, but roughly there's sort of three domains in this in this ADK protein. You need to do this right. There is a core region here. There is a NMP region, which is these residues here, and there's this lid region here. And this is just a, a piece of information that you have to know about the um, system before you go into analyze. This isn't something that MD analysis will tell you. Um, and, but we're looking at the angle between these two different, um, between these, sorry, between these three different, uh, between these three different domains. Um, so, we're looking at make, calculating these two different angles here, which is defined between these residues here. So this is a kind of a, a stock um, a stock analysis for this particular protein that if you are interested in studying this protein, you would sort of know about these domains and you would know about these residues if you're not sort of completely familiar with this sort of analysis. <laughs> so if we want to look at the, the, the boring uh, definition of, of what an angle is, it's technically this is this some sort of vector notation? Um, uh, and so if we're looking at the angle between these domains, we want to sort of come up with a position which exemplifies, which describes the, the domain as a whole. And so here we're going to use the center of geometry for these different selections. So if I run this, it will give me this A underscore, this, uh, this A underscore NMP is, is a position that exemplifies this NMP domain. And I've got to this by selecting a certain selector of residues, which also match this criteria of being either a backbone or named CB atom. And I'm then calculating the center of geometry of this particular selection. So this is doing a lot of things all in one, but it's selecting a bunch of residues selecting certain atoms within those residues, looking at all their coordinates and calculating the center of geometry to sort of give you a 
single point which represents those domains. Um, and we're doing this many times for different selections of residues. You can see here that the residue selection is changing as we do this. And this is selecting different portions of our protein and calculating a single point to represent that domain. Um, thing. So here in the picture, these would be dots on this picture that we're looking at here. Okay. So this. Um, so here's showing you how you would, if you wanted to implement this um, vector description of, of an angle, here's a long way of doing it with NumPy. You can kind of follow this derivation yourself if you want. But um, if you ran all this, you'd see that you get um, uh, angles for uh, between these uh, different domains um, here. And so this is doing sort of an arc cos of a dot product over some norm things here. This is sort of a quite boring way of doing it or quite long-winded way of doing it. But if you do the derivation yourself, you should agree with this. Um, but again, we can sort of do this again using this calc angles function that I previously introduced. Um, previously, I was giving um, arrays of positions from atom group, whereas here I'm doing something a bit different where I've calculated a position based upon a center of geometry. Uh, and so you can either give atom positions, but you can also give any position which you've calculated as a derivative of different positions. Like you can calculate centers of geometry, you can calculate the center of a ring. If you want to look at sort of pi stacking, you might calculate the center of mass for a particular ring, and you can sort of use that as a position. So the positions that you put into calc angles and, and similar functions don't actually have to be atomic positions. They can just be any position that you, you've calculated um, along the way. Um, so if I just run this, we can see that we get identical results to before. So this should be a way of maybe also building confidence in these sort of calc angles function and understanding how they're working under the hood. Okay. Um, yeah, now how am I doing for time? I'm still good, am I, or am I going long? You're still good. You've got about, mm -hmm. um, well, we have until 45 after, so. Okay, that's great then. Cool. You've still got more than 25 minutes. That's fantastic. So yeah, so we're going to look at another in-depth example here of looking at uh, writing your own hydrogen bond analysis code. Um, there is already code in MD analysis for doing hydrogen bond analysis. Um, this is more a fun example of showing how you can put together these different building blocks to uh, look at this yourself. Um, an advantage of doing it this way is that you can uh, know how the methodology works, but also tweak it to your own liking as well. Um, but I think it's just a good toy example. And so we're going to look at identifying hydrogen bonds. Um, uh, here we're using a definition of hydrogen bond, which you, you'll find different definitions. So we're using a geometric definition of a hydrogen bond where a you define and accept, you have to predefine oops, a set of acceptor atoms, um, a set of hydrogen atoms, and a set of donor atoms. Um, and then we're going to use a geometric criteria for if it's hydrogen bonded or not. So we're looking for a hydrogen acceptor distance of three angstroms and a acceptor hydrogen donor angle. So if you can think of an angle drawn between those three uh, atoms, this angle has to be greater than 120 degrees. Um, and so we're going to go back to this PEG system that we previously had. And so we're just going to select here. So this is going to select all of the oxygen atoms by selecting type OS and OH. And so this is the selection here. Uh, we've used a bit of a shorthand here where we've typed type OS, OH. This is equivalent to if I would have done um, type, oops, type OS or type phthalate. You, you could have written it like this, um, and you would have got the same um, you would have got the same group out. So because there's a lot of repetition when you want to select multiple types at once, you can just delete all of this piece here and just give it a, a, a list of different types, sort of a series of different types you want to select. And that's just a quick shorthand that we've used there. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, similarly, we're going to select hydrogens here based on their type. Um, this type again has come from your topology file, so you'll have to be familiar with the input file that you've used here. Uh, select this. We're going to select hydrogens. So you should always maybe check what your atom groups you've created are along the way. So we've got 21 uh, acceptors and we've got 8,000 hydrogens, and that sounds about right to me. I can quickly check what types these are. You know, they're all HWs. I can check their names, maybe. Yeah, so they're all called either H1 or H2, presumably because that's the two different hydrogens on the water. Um, same with the acceptors. I can look at maybe what res names they're part of. They're all called unlabeled. That's not very handy. Thanks, PDB. Um, similarly, I could look at the names of the different oxygen atoms that I've selected. And again, I can see that I've selected a few different names of oxygen. And it's always helpful to check what your atom groups are on the way. Um, yeah, so firstly, if I'm looking at this definition of a hydrogen bond, I want to check the distance between the um, acceptors and the hydrogens to see if a hydrogen has got close enough to an acceptor that's probably doing some hydrogen bond interaction. Um, so I'm going to use our friend distance array. So if we remember, the distance array takes two different uh, arrays of positions and we'll calculate all combinations of distances between them. So it'll give you a matrix of different outputs. Uh, so yeah, so this will give us a NumPy array. It has shape 21 by 8842. So if I, for example, if I sliced along the first row of this matrix, this is telling me the distance between the first acceptor and all of the different hydrogens. And we can see all along there, there's different distances. Um, smallest is 1.8 angstroms and, and the largest would be something large like 43 angstroms. Um, cool. So if I'm interested in finding contacts between these hydrogens and the acceptor, I'm going to have to apply some sort of uh, distance criteria to sort of look at where it's less than a particular interesting value. And so one way of doing this is to look at where the distance array is less than 3.0, for example. And this will give you a NumPy array of type Boolean, so it's, it's either true or false. Um, and so it will be the same shape as your distance array, but it's telling you is the distance array in each cell less than 3.0? Um, I think we can do dot sum on this to see sort of how many cells are the truths. So of those few thousand different distances I calculated, uh, 65 of them were less than three angstroms. So there's not many. We're looking for a needle in a haystack here. That's fine. Um, so a really handy function for dealing with this is this numpy dot where function. It will tell you where a particular uh, value is true is one way of thinking about it. So if we previously we had this um, true-false array that was quite hard to look at, and we can then ask NumPy where it's true. Um, and so looking at these uh, output arrays, we get given two different arrays. The first one is the rows. This is corresponding to our acceptor atom indices. So this is the indices of the atoms within the acceptor atom group. Um, and then we have this hydrogen um, index as well, which is the indices of the hydrogen atoms from within the hydrogen atom group. So uh, here we're seeing kind of four zeros in a row. This is telling us that the first acceptor has seen four different hydrogens. And these are the indices of the hydrogen here. Got a quick question. Uh, if it, yeah, this is cool. Okay, this is a bit confusing. It takes your head a bit to get around, but sort of this is how you can start to, to do this. Um, it's important to remember that these are the indices of the atoms from within the atom group rather than the indices in sort of the entire universe. That's a mistake I've made a few times. Okay. So um, I was previously telling you that cap distance is a great way of doing this um, because it's a lot faster. And so you can achieve a similar effect with cap distance. Again, we're putting in our acceptor positions and our hydrogen positions. We're putting in the box information here. 
And we're also putting in a max cutoff here of 3.0 because that was the maximum distance we were interested in looking at when we were thinking about hydrogen bonding. Um, so if you time this, you'll see it's a little bit faster. Um, it will get faster when you look at larger and larger systems. So you might not realize you need this until you run a really big simulation, then you then you realize all of a sudden your analysis is going slow. Um, so this is a similar way to get out the, the indices here. So previously we got out the indices using numpy.where, so we, we masked the logical array to pull out the indices of where different entries were true. Um, cap distance the function will do that uh, always because it's kind of giving a sparse matrix output. Um, so here's how to sort of achieve the same effect here. Okay, so here again, we're unpacking the different array here using a bit of Python magic. Uh, okay, so I said before that this accept index array here, which looks like this, um, we got, we got the indices of the acceptor atoms, which were forming hydrogen bonds. Um, and so we can slice our atom groups with this array of indices to pull out those atoms. Um, so we saw this in the first half of the materials this morning. Um, an interesting quirk that's going to happen is because we have this number zero four times, the atom group we produce will actually have four different copies of the first atom in it as well. Um, and that's actually useful to us this time, and, it's, and we're going to use that to our advantage, but it's worth remembering that's what's going to happen. Um, so here we're going to slice our initial arrays of acceptors and hydrogens. We're, um, we're going to filter those down based upon who was potentially forming a hydrogen bond here, and we're going to do that by slicing it with these index arrays here. So if I look at the first atom in this potential H bond acceptors here. It's um, this atom 3 O of type OH of resin and whatever. But then if I look at the first, confusingly it's the same atom, and this is because I've sliced it with a repeated index here. If I look at a different index, I would see that I've pulled out atom 16 here. Um, okay, and we've done the same for the hydrogens as well. So we've, we've filtered down our initial atom groups based upon a distance cutoff. Um, so we're going to move on to the next step in looking at our hydrogen bond analysis, which would be looking at the angle between these three parties. So we've looked at the um, acceptor and the hydrogen. Now we're going to look at the donor and what is the angle formed between those three positions. Um, so to do this, we need to go backwards from our hydrogen atoms. We need to sort of look backwards to the donor atom that was uh, that is chemically bonded to these hydrogen atoms. Um, here we're going to use a trick where for each hydrogen atom, if I pull up a single hydrogen atom, let's call him Harry, it is, um, if I just have this atom here, Harry the hydrogen, um, I can look at his bonded atoms using this bonded atoms attribute. And this tells me that he's bonded to Two different atoms. Why is it bonded to different atoms? Oh, uh, that's probably a constraint the second bond we're seeing there. That's interesting. Anyway, we can see that it's, it has a chemical bond to this oxygen that's on the same residue. So if we just look at Harry here, he was um, on res ID 457 and he was a hydrogen of type HW. And the first thing he's bonded to was an oxygen of type water here. And so we want to basically go from all of our potential hydrogen bond hydrogens, we're going to go backwards and look at the donor, which is chemically bonded to them. Um, and to do that, we're going to use this little call here, um, which is actually strangely calling the Python sum function. So this is a built-in function in Python, which is sum. Um, usually you would give it a list of numbers, and it would tell you that 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. Uh, a strange thing is that when you sum atoms in MD analysis, it forms an atom group, and that's a very handy trick. Um, you can previously do this when you're looking at creating atom groups. If I just did hydrogen bond acceptors to hydrogen bond hydrogens, 
I get given an atom group which has the sum of these two. So it's essentially smushed the two atom groups together and concatenated them to form a larger atom group. Um, we saw this, I think, in the previous materials. Here I'm using the Python sum function to do a list comprehension here. So I'm going to run over this. So basically, for each, when you look at a list comprehension in Python, you often have to read these ones backwards, is the best way to get your head around them. But um, for each hydrogen in the potential hydrogen bond, Hydrogens. I'm going to pull off the first bonded atom to it, and I'm going to sum all of these different values. Um, and so hopefully you can see that this is going to walk through the different hydrogens, pull off the first bonded atom to it, and form an atom group of all of those donors. Okay, so we can look at this hydrogen bond donors array it's got 65 atoms which is what we expect because it's the same length as our hydrogen so we've created an array of roughly some length that's a good start we can look at the types we have pulled off all of the ow the oxygen water i think that means um we can put their names which i think is also going to be so i think we've created the right atom group here so now we can move on to looking at this angle criteria um, we're going to use our friend calc angles. <laughs> Promise you'd be useful. So we're putting in the acceptor hydrogen donor in that order. It's important to put the apex of the angle in the middle array. Uh, we're remembering to put in the box information here. So we're taking account for minimum image convention. And we're converting this from radians to degrees because our criteria was in was in um was in degrees. So if we do this, we get out a bunch of angles, which is great. And we can see that we have some angles of 150 degrees, which are quite wide. And then we have some angles which are quite tight at 70 degrees. So again, we can use our friend numpy.where to look at where the angles are greater than 120. So when this hydrogen bond angles is wide enough, that it's probably energetically doing a hydrogen bond. And we get out the uh, indices here. We can then again filter down our atom groups again using these indices. So this is a atom group we filtered first based upon distances, and we filtered it again based upon an angle of criteria. So we filtered down these atom groups twice, and so we are repeatedly slicing them into smaller and smaller atom groups here. Um, so we've we've narrowed this down to about forty three different atoms. Um, and so as a quick sanity check, we knew, we knew that in our system before, um, if we, we knew that we had 21 oxygen acceptors in the system, and our attempt at finding all the hydrogen bonds has turned up about 43 different uh, atoms. And so it looks like we're getting about two hydrogen bonds per acceptor, which is sort of as a ballpark figure is roughly the same. Okay. There's a salute. There's a quick question here for how you would wrap this into a function yourself. I'm going to leave that as a uh, example that you can go through in your own time. But it's a quite fun example of how you can. This is often how I kind of write my own analysis. Is I'll have some sort of scrap code in a notebook that I'm going through and sort of iterating on quite fast. And then when I'm happy that it's working, I'll put it into a Python function here and I'll save that in a file somewhere and sort of keep reusing that for a while. Um, so you shouldn't be this is this is how I work is I often have sort of scrappy code here where I'm kind of figuring out how a function should work. And then when I'm happy with it and when I've sort of sanity checked it and it's given me a roughly correct answer, I'll turn it into a function here. I'll leave myself comments because otherwise I'll forget how it worked. So this is how you could do that. Um, cool. And this is hopefully showing you how these functions that I was talking about before can be kind of used in practice. Okay. So finally, we're going to get on to trajectories. So everything I've been talking about previously, I think a lot of people have probably been thinking that it's, it's kind of only looking at single frames and we're instead more interested in trajectories. And so this is how we can look at a trajectory. So we're going to load a PSF and a DCD file this time. And so we're going to look at this dot trajectory attribute of the universe. Um, so here, if we just look at the object here, it tells us that we've loaded this ADK DIMMS DCD file here. Uh, 
it tells us that it has 98 frames and it has 3,341 different atoms. Um, so we can look at the number of frames, we can look at the length of it, these two things are equivalent. Um, I think someone was asking before about time, but we can look at the DT, the, the time between different frames. This is different from the integration time of your um, simulation. This is the time between different saved frames. And we can look at the total time of the simulation. So this is looking at a 96 picosecond calculation. Okay, so each single frame of the of the simulation has a time step object. Um, so this is on the u dot trajectory object. You can have this dot ts, and this is going to give you the time step. Uh, the time step has lots of fun uh, attributes. I think it has the dimensions on it. It'll have various different things. Um, have, for example, a reference to the time of that particular time frame. Uh, a fun thing here actually is is uh, here are the dimensions is none, which means that we don't actually have a period Excel defined for this universe. You might occasionally encounter that. This is what the time step object is. You might often see this and wonder what it is. It's just a representation of the time step that you're looking at. Um, so yeah, finally, we can look at looking at different frames in our trajectory. So we've been looking at a single frame, but we've been sitting on sort of a, a trajectory of data. Um, so by default, when you load a trajectory into MD analysis, it will only ever look at a single frame at a single time. Um, and you have to sort of move through the trajectory yourself to sort of load different time frames in. Uh, one way of thinking about this is it's like playing a film of the simulation. Um, on, on the screen of your television at any point, you'll see a single frame and you have to sort of move between these frames. It wouldn't make sense to look at the frame, look at the movie if you're looking at all the frames all at once, because you'll get all of the different pictures all at once. So we're looking at a single frame at a single time. And so when you call atom group dot positions, it's giving you the positions for a single frame. It's not giving you all of their potent, all of their different positions over the trajectory. Okay. So to move between the different um, frames, we can use trajectory indexing, which is a lot like how we were indexing the atom groups before. Um, so we're going to create an atom group, which is just the first two atoms of the universe, and then we can print that position. So these are these two positions. We can then index this u dot trajectory object, and this is going to load a different frame from the file uh, from the trajectory file. And so we can see that the current frame has now changed to six. If we print the positions, um, we can see that these positions are slightly different to these positions. The atoms have moved, uh, which is sometimes a bit confusing because the, the way we've accessed this data is the same, right? We've called first two atoms dot positions here and been told this. And then we've called the same piece of code and got given a different set of positions. And so you just have to remember that when you access uh, the positions, you will get the currently loaded positions. And so if I run this cell up here, for example, I'm getting the positions from the sixth frame. If I change this to zero, I load the first frame, I get back to those positions and then, right? So you can play around with this a bit. It's a bit counterintuitive at first, but the thing to remember is, is that the trajectory object loads the positions. And then when you access dot positions on an atom group, it gives you the currently loaded positions. Okay, and this is what this little reminder box here is telling you. Uh, okay, so this is also telling you that um, if you edit positions, you, you can edit the positions by here we're doing, we're setting the positions attribute to zero, and we've set all the positions to zero. But if I um, if I load a new frame and then, and then look at the positions, they'll change. And if I go back to the original, uh, if I go back to the original first frame, I've loaded the positions again. So any changes that you made to the trajectory um, 
any positions that you make to the positions of atoms isn't saved when you move around between different frames in the trajectory. So when you're, if you're modifying your coordinates as you go, and then you sort of rewind and run your trajectory back again, you won't have any modifications you made. And this is sometimes really useful and sometimes really annoying. And it's something you have to keep in mind is that when you modify the positions attribute, it is, it is lost when you change the frame. Okay, so there's some kind of questions here to sort of test your um, to test your understanding of that. Okay, so finally, what's probably more common for you to do is to iterate through the trajectory, um, and you can do this in a for loop like this. So we often use this uh, way of saying it is for time step in new dot trajectory. And then inside this loop, so inside this indented piece of code in Python, the trajectory will be iterating, and so you'll get many um, many calls to the code, which is inside the full loop. And so here I'm creating a list called times, and I'm going to repeatedly append the current time to this list. And then we can see that I get out a list of many different times because I've I've iterated over the trajectory and I've, I've um, appended a different time each time on this line here. Um, so if we're doing something maybe more interesting, if I had an atom group, which was the this atom here, so if I just had an atom, I could then also, for example, the atom position over time. Let's make it a more fun example. Uh, ah, mm -hmm. there you go. Yes. Um, so if I select a single atom from you to atoms here, I can print the atom position over time, and then I can see that over time the atoms ever so slightly moving right. So this is what we might expect. Um, okay, and this is giving me. All the positions over the whole trajectory. Uh, I can also select sub portions of the trajectory here. So here I'm using this Python slice notation where you give us start index, stop index, and also step index. Um, so here's a bit of a confusing one where I start on the first frame, I go up to the second before last frame, and I skip every two. So this is going to give me uh, a lot fewer frames. Um, as maybe a simpler, if I wanted to look at, for example, every 10th frame, you would do this. So if your analysis is taking a very long time, you can sometimes run sort of every 10th frame or something just to see how it's going to look. And then when you sort of look like the look of what you're producing, you would then run every frame, for example. Um, there's some exercises here about doing reverse time and things like that. Um, Okay, so we're going to wrap this up by looking at how you can kind of put together all of the different things that we have looked at so far, how we can use our sort of MD analysis lived distances module function called to look at trajectory analysis. Uh, so we're going to go back to our PG system. Uh, we're going to select all of these oxygen atoms. Um, I'm then going to append the radius of duration to each frame. And I can plot that. No, I can't plot that. Ah, I'm importing that plot there. Okay. So to quickly recap what we've done here, we've made a empty list for the radius of duration here called ROG. We've selected our oxygen atoms, and then inside a for loop, where we're looping over the trajectory, we can append to the list the radius of duration, and then we can plot that using the plot lib here. And this shows us that our radius of duration over time goes wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Life's good. Um, okay. There's an exercise here where you can look at this ADK example that we're looking at previously, where we can look at the protein domains opening and closing over time. You can look at that yourself, but it's similar to the analysis we looked at, but we've placed it inside of a for loop. Um, so let me just run this. So 
So this is all the analysis that we previously went over. I've just put it inside of a for loop. So this is again quite common. You can kind of figure out some analysis on a single frame of, of your trajectory. You then put it inside a for loop to look at how that property changes over time. Uh, we're plotting this for matplotlib, so we're sort of plotting these two different angles over time. Um, and we get sort of this frame and angle. It's a pretty nice plot. Okay, so that's everything I had to say about trajectory analysis. Uh, I'm pretty sure I probably raised some questions amongst you, so I would encourage you to ask those in the Q&A feature. And I and my many friends here will try and answer you as fast as we can. Um, this notebook should be available for you to download. So if you were confused by it the first time around, you can, you can download it and go through it in your own time. And I would encourage you to do that. Thank you. Now it's time for anyone to ask any questions on Richard's session, um, or you can also take a little break. We'll be reconvening at 18. Uh, UTC. And then afterwards, we'll just have a final open Q&A session uh, where you're welcome to, again, raise your hand, unmute yourself and ask anything related to the material presented here or anything else related to MD analysis. Um, and But otherwise, um, you can feel free to drop off. Um, just as a reminder that We'll be reaching out to you afterwards via email, the email that you registered with, and we'll again share all of these materials and some of the resources that were mentioned in the chat today. Um, and once the recording is available, we'll also make sure to send that link to you and let you know where we do end up uploading that. Um, and we'll also be reaching out to you for your feedback. So look out for a survey from us, and it's really important for us to hear what you thought of this workshops so that we can keep making them better. Um, and we will be offering more of these workshops in the coming months. So make sure to keep an eye out on our Discord page, our LinkedIn, our blog, um, all of our different media that we use to communicate with you all and look for those announcements of future workshops as well. Um, but again, uh, Please ask any questions if you have them. Feel free to take a break. We'll stay around to make sure that we're here um, until the till when we reconvene at 18 UTC. So let us know if you have anything that you want to know about. So someone's asking if you can use MD analysis to calculate the free energy of binding of ligands to proteins. Um, a short answer is no, and a longer answer is um, inside MD analysis, there's no um, knowledge of the force field, so of, of the uh, interaction energies between atoms, for example. And so you can't, in general, you can't calculate the energy of a bonded stretch, for example. You can't calculate the electrostatic attraction between two atoms um, because there's just no force field information. Um, and if you want to calculate those sorts of things, you need to put it into a molecular dynamics engine and sort of run a real simulation. Um, and what you so that's more of a job for a molecular dynamics engine like a Gromax or an OpenMM or something similar. Um, whereas you can use MD analysis to calculate things after the simulation that are uh, based upon the product of the MD analysis engine. So when you're looking at the trajectory, you can then look at how the atoms moved through your trajectory. Um, so it's more for post-processing and definitely things like a binding free energy is something you calculate during the, during the MD calculation. Um, so you should look at that. If you're interested in binding free energies, I can recommend you the Alchemistry Wiki, which I'll, I'll send you a link to that in the written q a but there's a wiki there which i think has a tutorial on running a binding free energy calculation with gromax so i'll send you a link to that but a short answer was no and a long answer was still no i guess just you know to expand there so some of that depends as well exactly how you're like what method you're using for calculating 
free energy. So um, I guess as, as someone who has run umbrella sampling simulations, um, that you you can get sort of energies from that. And the, the answer there is still that, you know, MD analysis doesn't have anything directly to do with that. Um, but I have kind of roundabout used MD analysis to say, um, gather a coordinate from my simulations that I can then sort of um, having, you know, done stuff with, you know, I use Gromax and then using the WAM tool to get a, a profile that I can then get data from MD analysis to sort of reweight my um, free energy profiles. Uh, so there are still some things you can use it for there. But uh, again, at least at the moment, the the overall answer is is there's nothing directly for energy calculations in MD analysis. Okay, so there's been a, a another, uh, yeah, added to the, the Q&A here. Um, yeah, I think a, a module should be included in MD analysis for the energy calculations from the simulation log files. Um, uh, so yeah, so I guess this is, um, this would be something that I don't know exactly uh, fully what would need to be involved there, but it, I guess it's, it's something potentially that um, could be added uh, where, so again, especially um, uh, where starting to move MD analysis as well. Um, uh, so we've introduced this thing called uh, MDA kits uh, that um, the idea behind that is going to be um, to make it easier for uh, individual people, say, um, so like you, uh, that if there is something that um, they would find useful that they can uh, write, a, you know, a, a simple package that would use MD analysis to do that. So that could be, you know, going through log files to calculate energies. Uh, and more or less the idea there is that because um, there's only a limited number of us who are working on um, sort of the core MD analysis team uh, that while there's a lot of useful features that a lot of people might use that, uh, you know, we can't always keep on top of adding all of that and we're not experts in everything, uh, but we're hoping with these MDA kits uh, that that's something that, yeah, more people will be able to add kind of these um, these useful tools and then it, it goes onto a sort of a central uh, repository um, or registry that uh, then other users could, could come along and find that. Um, so yeah, so you, um, uh, there should be uh, details on that. I mean, at least if you search for MDA kits, hopefully that would, would come up if that sounds interesting. Otherwise, if this is just a, you know, a feature that um, you want to suggest to see if, if someone else might take up to, to build, you could post that um, again on one of our, um, our mailing lists or even the um, uh, issue tracker on, on the GitHub. Um, and, you know, uh, gather some discussion there. So we're now back from the break period. So um, we're here if you have any other questions. Um, and we're a smaller group now. So if you'd like, um, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask live. Um, but otherwise, if you have no further questions, thanks again for joining. And again, we'll be following up with all of the resources we talked about today and a follow-up survey. Thanks everyone for coming. It's been nice to see so many people interested. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, yeah. We have a question about, can we plot comparative graphs or multiple simulations for RMSD, RMSF, radius of generation, et cetera? Yes, short answer is yes. So as long as you have all of the resulting outputs in the same, I guess, let's assume that we are in a Jupyter notebook because to let's be honest, we will be. Um, if you are kind of doing a bunch of, you know, you have many universes or, you know, different, you're looking at different systems or you have the same system du duplicated and you're just looking at multiple repeats, as long as, it's all in the memory, uh, no reason why you can't just grab all of the outputs 
of say, you know, uh, a function that calculates the RMC and then just put them in the same uh, in the same plot. So it's a matter of it's more of a matter of plotting than a matter of MD analysis in, in that case. Um, but yeah, don't know if I've answered. If there are no more questions, um, I think that we'll probably go ahead and close the session. Um, so one more time, thank you to the instructors and thank you all of you for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.